I'm Gold Derby editor Daniel Montgomery here with the creative team from Star Trek Picard, which uh, aired its third and final season this spring. We've got showrunner Terry Metalis, uh, visual effects supervisor uh, Jason Zimmerman, makeup department head James McKinnon, prosthetics designer Vincent Van Dyke, and costume designer Michael Crow. Uh, well, I'll, I'll start with uh, Terry. Uh, you know, the season reunited the cast of The Next Generation, but, uh, you know, the legacy of Star Trek has as much to do with the artists behind the scenes uh, uh, making it all possible. How has it been to have this kind of creative team on board to bring the show to life? Oh, amazing. Uh, I, I mean, it, the, the show is only as good as, as, as these fine gentlemen here. Uh, it is, uh, and I'm extraordinarily uh lucky to to have uh these fine folk here it, it's interesting because um we're all um uh, blessed in some ways but also cursed to have the the amount of legacy on this show because it means that uh you have almost 56 years of creative material to draw from but that also means you have a lot of rules and regulations and canon that you have to adhere to. So there's there's a there's a kind of pressure to it as well. Um, not you know taking in of course all the time clocks of production a, a, as well. So um, it's it's not just a. Um, uh, uh, an open, you know, blank canvas for all these uh, gentlemen as well. Like it, it's, it's actually much harder uh, in a lot of ways. So, so the pressures on everyone here are are extreme in a lot of ways because uh, um, in in some ways they're 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 standing on the shoulders of giants, but in some ways they're underneath giants as well. Uh, in in that way, it, so it's uh, it, it's a lot. Uh, and uh, speaking of pressure, uh, seasons two and three of Picard were shot back to back. Um, you know, how how challenging was that for uh, each of you uh, uh, who who worked on both seasons uh, to to kind of manage? Like, was it a lot of stamina required? Uh, Terry, you can start. Uh, well, it, they you know we say back to back, but also like on top of each other. I, I mean, for Jay Z, right? I mean, you're doing all of them at once. Yep. Uh, uh, you know, I think probably for all of us, I think maybe Michael. I think you are you were the only one blessed to only concentrate on on season season three. But uh, I mean, for me, I, I only had the luxury of breaking away for eight weeks prior. Uh, but I still would have to be involved still with season two and check in with Akiva and be like, all right, so you're leaving off where here? And then uh, and, and little things there here and there, but it was still extraordinary and still being part of editorial, but it, it was a lot. What about, what about the rest of you? Yeah, I think, I think, uh, and for the makeup and hair department, yeah, still shooting season two and being able to get ready for season three along with Vincent to be able to create the new aliens for the next season with that turnaround was very, very, very tight. Yeah. Yeah. I think for VFX, it's just, it, it all feels like one giant season rather than two that are separated. You just keep going for, you know, over two years. So it, it, it definitely feels like a much larger project, but, you know, fortunately we have a, a, a big team that sort of helps to manage everything. So I'm not stuck by myself having to do all that. Yeah, I can relate to that. It, it definitely feels as though that it's just one continuous uh, journey. It almost in some ways helped. Uh, you know, if you have a break, sometimes you lose that momentum and we were just going. So, you know, the crew of, of artists and technicians in my studio that are producing a lot of these prosthetics, um, it's it's just a, a streamlined process. So uh, in many ways, our headspace was already in the appropriate arena and we could kind of just continue on with, uh, with the, the setup of it all. And so it worked out really well for us. Yeah, and I mean, even though we came in, uh, my team came in five weeks with five weeks of prep, um, and we overlapped with the team on season two. Most of the costume department was uh, coming back for season three, um, and we were overlapping with them finishing what they were building for season two while we were trying to start building season three. So it, it was daunting to start with. Right, and typically you would have a lot more time. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. No. I, when uh, you contacted me, I was I was hesitant. I mean, it was. Oh, I remember. I was like, was, Come on. <laughs> please do it. Was, it. As fantastic as the opportunity was presenting, you know, having the the legacy cast come back, like there were lots of reasons to say yes, and then there was the time frame that was just scary. And you were coming off of Hawkeye, right? Is that what you were? Um, I finished Hawkeye, and then I had done a, a stint on Gray Man. Um, right. Um, and I had just come back from Europe when when I got the call. Yeah, and uh, Michael, as you mentioned, you're uh, you know you're dressing the cast of the Next Generation uh, uh, that's coming back, who have looks that are uh, very well known by the audience. Uh, you know, what was what was the process of of kind of updating those characters and and kind of giving them the looks that they have now for where their characters are now? Um, I mean. Terry and I had a lot of discussions about, you know, characters like, especially the first, in the first couple of episodes with Beverly and Worf and, uh, you know, coming back, uh, Riker, um, in those first episodes and where those characters are in their lives now and how we wanted to present them. Um, you know, Beverly has been off on her own adventures and has sort of become this badass action hero um, in the time that she's been away from the rest of the crew um, and had to survive on her own. Um, and, you know, Worf has sort of also become his own person um, uh, outside of, you know, the Klingon Empire and the Federation and, and has sort of evolved. And we wanted to show that in their costumes. Yeah, and um, <clears throat> you know, uh, Jack Crusher is one of the characters who was introduced this season. John Luke and Beverly, uh, John Luke and Beverly's son. Um, you know, Terry, what what inspired the creation of that character uh, to sort of continue this legacy of, of you know, John Luke Picard? Well, it it what inspired it was what was the last relationship that was sort of unexplored in. Patrick Stewart in Jean-Luc Picard's life and in conversations with Patrick Stewart um and it felt like he had already kind of explored a daughter relationship with kind of Soji in season one so we we said what about a son and needed to be a son that was fully grown <laughs> to, to have a relationship with um and you know and then what would be the best for drama what would you know what who who would who would that character be um uh who who uh the, and so we started to ask ourselves what if you know what do we pass on what what are, what if Jean-Luc Picard had passed on maybe some of the things some of the worst parts of him you know that that was the core idea was if he, what if he had passed on some tiny part of the lacutus gene uh that was you know the initial idea of the season um and then jack crusher was born from from there we wanted to make him uh, this sort of rogue who was born outside of the starfleet system you know a little captain kirk a, a little a, a little uh picard a little uh a little more dashing uh a, a little bit of a of a of a criminal um who who had to who had to break the rules to survive to do for the greater good um and that's how he came together and then that started to translate into wardrobe uh with, with michael yeah and what were those wardrobe decisions like michael um you know we wanted to make sure that uh he felt you know a little uh, the 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 word is roguish, but you know he, that he was action ready. He was you know he has a phaser on his hip. He's got um, a costume that allows him to be active and um, you know do whatever stunts he needs to do. Uh, and yeah, another one of the uh, standout additions to the show this season was Vatic, uh, you know, that villain character uh, played by Amanda Plummer. 
uh, you know, she's a changeling, which calls back to the Dominion War that took place on Deep Space Nine. Uh, what inspired you to call back to that, Terry? And, and was there more from Deep Space Nine you considered bringing into the story? Well, there was always, we, well, there's more we, 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 in initial conversations, we had all sorts of ideas. Um, the changelings are just a, a wonderful kind of villain because they can look and sound like anyone. Um, and I always had, you know, as a Star Trek fan, you ask yourself, oh man, if I could write a Star Trek movie, who are the villains you want to bring back? And what are the team ups? You know what I mean? It's just, it's that geek thing you have in your head. Um, and so as a paranoia thriller, um, they're a fantastic villain for a season of television. So that's where, that's where I went to. Um, and so, uh, and just Amanda Plummer has just been, I've just been a fan of Amanda Plummer for, for God, just going back to forever, for decades, since the Fisher King, since, uh, you know, when I saw her on Broadway and Agnes of God, like, she's just like incredible. Um, and so I think it's like the first name in the writer's room I brought up and casting was, I said, reach out. And they're like, yeah, she's, actually like a giant Star Trek fan would love nothing more to do this. And so lightning in a bottle. And creating that uh, Vatic character uh, through costumes and, and makeup, uh, what was that uh, process like working with Amanda Plummer? Uh, James, you can start. Yeah, Amanda's a very, very sweet. And, and having her sit in the chair, she is very knowledgeable on that character that she wanted to create as well so working together with her to create that uh paler face we got rid of her eyebrows and obviously vincent made the uh brilliant uh, scars on her cheeks uh and vincent can talk a little bit more about that and and the reference behind that uh just a fun fun process she's amazing to listen to and super super creative in a in a in a great way for us because it puts us in a creative mood too if you have an actor that sits in the chair at the same time that has opinions and what they want them to be we can come together and make that cool character yeah it's quite collaborative i mean it's it's nice when you have somebody who's excited who's who's weighing in on the the overall look and aesthetic of character um but amanda's got such a great look herself and I, and I think that there's part of the the idea of you know we don't want to cover that up completely she's she's got just such great character um and so it, it took a lot of different turns before we landed where we did but one of the references were uh were scarring that um was symmetrical which is not really something you see in nature um you know things in nature ordinarily are not very symmetrical and if you do some scar work uh it can very classically be on one side of the face and, and through an eye or something like that. And so the idea was to create something that had this um, this symmetrical scarring in a pattern that felt kind of unique. And we referenced a lot of um, uh, jellyfish uh, sting injuries and things like that, that that give you some very organic, very interesting scars that uh, not a lot of people are familiar with, but um, but left us with something very unique and very, uh, very iconic for her character, I think. Yeah, and likewise with the costume, we we spent uh, or I spent hours talking to Amanda about you know what she what she wanted the costume to be able to do function wise, but also about the character. And we talked about the the layers and and the organic quality of the character. Um, and through the costume, I tried to use these organic textures and lots of layering. Uh, that sort of flows in and out of each other to give the impression, you know, before you know who she is and what she is, um, if you look back at it, you can tell you, you can see those ideas in the costume. Uh, and the introduction of Vatic also meant the introduction of her ship, the Shrike. Uh, uh, Jason, what went into the design and visual effects for that ship? Yeah, I mean, you know, it starts with production design and Terry and Dave Blast sort of talking about, you know, the different ideas and what they kind of want it to look like. Um, so there's an approval process. There's sort of a back and forth that goes into that. And then once we get our hands on it, we start to sort of take it and make it camera ready, which, you know, means adding photo real textures. And then, um, you know, anytime you have a new ship, you have to sort of experiment with its movement, you know, because it's a new ship based on how big it is, it may be fast, it may be slow, maybe it's more, you know, agile or less agile. And so 
Um, I think we got into some animation tests right away with Terry and started doing some previs to sort of see, you know, how this thing would behave, you know, as opposed to the other Federation ships. Was it, you know, fast and how the different weapons worked and all those sorts of things. And so we, we really, once we get it and we have it sort of textured, uh, start to drop it into shots and maybe just experiment with the different movements to see what sort of, you know, way we can kind of bring it to life as another character. And uh, speaking of weapons, it has that uh, portal weapon uh, that it uses to uh, first destroy a Starfleet facility and also in its battle against the Titan. Um, how, how did you envision that, you know, device that, you know, how that would look and how that would operate? Well, I, I think, you know, I, again, I think it starts with conversations and meetings and, you know, sort of picking Terry's brain and everybody's brain to see sort of what they have in mind. Um, and then once we start to get a cut put together, we start to look at the shots and see, you know, how it might behave in an actual real world environment. And it does take a lot of tests. You know, I think in that case, we did a lot of um, experimentation even before we had the plates just to sort of see what it would look like if this giant portal opened up and dropped a building, um, which is, you know, sort of a large undertaking. And so we started to experiment with what that would look like with that much volume sort of falling out of the sky and, you know, how the different, you know, parts of it would behave and what it would look like. So it, again, it goes back to a lot of, you know, look development early on, a lot of conversations and tests. And then once we had the footage, uh, you know, we started to actually put it into the shots and sort of establish, you know, the movement of things. Speed is a really important thing with something like that, just due to the scale of stuff. But, um, you know, it's a lot of back and forth, a lot of reviews, a lot of conversations and refinements to make sure that we get the physics right on something that, you know, we've never seen before. So we have to sort of figure out what the best way is to show that in a way that, you know, is not going to take the audience out of the story. It's a lot of pressure because, you know, if this was a feature, you would have done that with about 10 more shots. Right. So, and we, I think we did what we do it with two. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We did it with two shots. So, so, you know, the pressure on Jay Z is extraordinary. And, and you don't, you don't have the luxury of, of uh, endless revisions, endless previs on it. And so, conceptually, that's a big idea. Portal opens up from the sky, drops a building through it, then the sky opens up and it comes through. So you're kind of, it's a big gamble, like if this is going to work or not. And you just, you just, you're just hoping we're all huddled up, hoping that this stupid idea is going to play, is going to pay out. And, and this is just a case of, um, of a bunch of mad geniuses pulled it off and, uh, and, and the proof is in the pudding. It, it just, it just ended up working by the time it was done, uh, we we uh, were just we're so fortunate to have an incredible visual effects team, uh, you know, uh, with with everybody with on set too with Brian Tatoski is another is another gentleman uh, uh, and uh, who 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 is with us through and through, um, and it, it, and uh, and our, our storyboarding is too is a part of it that's that that's key to helping us out to 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 making making sure that. Are we telling the story of the visual effect too? It, it is tricky because again, you only have so many bites at the apple. Uh, and another one of the uh, uh, memorable effects is is changeling transformation. Uh, you know, familiar from Deep Space Nine, but it's very different uh, as seen in Picard. And of course, yeah. this is a different uh, a breed of changeling than than we uh, saw in Deep Space Nine. Uh, what you know. Uh, Jason, how did you re-envision and reconceive the effects around Changeling? Well, I mean, we start, you know, of course, revisiting canon and kind of seeing what came before us. I think, you know, that's sort of our touchstone for everything in Trek. And so you, you start by going there and then you start to have the conversations and the concept meetings sort of, um, you know, again, what everybody's envisioning, what it's going to look like. Um, and then, you know, once we got you know, the footage, we actually started to experiment with, you know, what we had, because, you know, like to Terry's point, you know, once when you read it in a script, it's one thing, but then when you have the footage and you're ready to actually do it, how does that translate from the page onto the actual shot? And so we did a lot of, you know, R&D, again, a lot of look development, um, especially, I think, you know, experimenting with different textures and how this would sort of, you know, look in the real world and trying to do something that would look photographic. Um, and also a nod to the fact that it is a little bit different. It's not the exact same effect. And so we had to do something that felt that it was set apart, but was close enough that it reminded everybody of what came before it. So, 
Um, you know, we did a lot of revisions to sort of get that right. I think we ended up looking at a lot of different sort of like meat textures, like almost raw meat in, in, in order to get something that was photographic and also that the audience would look at and go like, yeah, I know what that texture is. That makes sense in this environment. Um, and then we experimented with movement and speed and all that stuff to sort of get it to a way where it, it felt as realistic as possible, but, you know, didn't sort of go too far into that in Canyon Valley. Uh, and there's also the return of the Borg Queen. Um, you know, what made you bring that uh, character as sort of like this end game villain for uh, season three, Terry, uh, and 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 sort of where the Borg are at that stage? Well, again, it started with uh, with with a core idea: is what if Picard had passed on the the very very worst part of himself, but the cutest. Um, and it also felt like if this was the last uh, Picard story, the last next gen story, then you have to go up against your nemesis, you know, in the way that Kirk would have to face the Klingons again, Batman should probably face the Joker, Sherlock Holmes should face Moriarty. It felt like that was the right way to do it. But it also, we, you know, the Borg had been played a, a, a few times it needed to be an unexpected Borg it needed to be uh the last version of the Borg um and that's where these two fine gentlemen came in which was this would needed to be a dying Borg um this their last attempt their end game um uh their their last generation um their last attempt to uh raise their army uh and so that meant probably uh, their final form, the final boss, the most hideous representation of it. Uh, and so uh, that was a big challenge, again, uh, under extraordinary time constraints uh, uh, to do that. And uh, I, I'll let them take over and tell you <laughs> about that. Yeah, she, she, was, um, she was daunting to say the least, but it's interesting, I mean, going back to what we were saying earlier is that we're looking back at uh, previous revisions of, of Borg Queen. It also means that we're looking back at our latest uh, revision of Borg Queen. So we're looking back at our own work from season two and taking notes from that um, and, and working that in. So working closely with Neville Page here um, and, and creating what this overall aesthetic, this look is, like Terry said, she's, she's this dying kind of decomposing queen, um, but yet we also don't want her to appear weak i mean there's there's a lot of factors that are going into this um we had a great canvas um and a really great design uh that was that was created by neville to kind of riff off of it's it's then my job to kind of take that and apply that design to the the actress and, and really start to morph that into something that works well as a prosthetic makeup uh and then and then working closely with james on figuring out how all this is going to uh get applied on the day and and come together uh, seamlessly. Um, I'm really pleased with the way that she that she turned out. I think that it's uh, it kind of checks all the boxes. It's got some really great influences um, from like we like we mentioned prior versions of Queen, but also just some great Giger stuff that that is beautiful. And um, I'm, I'm I'm really quite happy with the way that she turned out. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and it, it's about a four and a half, a little little about a four and a half hour process. So. Us getting in at our at one thirty in the morning, starting at two, and having her ready to go at uh, six thirty in the morning when everybody showed up was a was a fun process. And our uh, again, our our actress that was underneath that makeup was uh, was amazing because that was a lot of pieces and a lot of glue. And then and then to, and then to work and then she had to work for yeah. fourteen hours and then an hour to take her out. Um, and at one point, um, Jack Crusher is. Um assimilated by the Borg, uh, you know, from a makeup and costume perspective, was that a lot of reference to, uh, you know, Locutus and when Picard was was assimilated, was that sort of a lot of that look that you wanted to bring back, uh, with, uh, Michael? Um, yeah, I mean, in conversation with Terry, I think it was very important that we hearken back to Locutus visually. And that's really where we started. We, I mean, we produced that costume really quickly. And it might have been one of the only costumes that we didn't produce a sketch of before we started working on it. 
Yeah. Um, I don't think Terry ever saw anything until like we were in development of the costume okay. um, because of the way we had to, to jump into it. And uh, I gave uh, Dorothy um, Dulac, who was creating the costume, I gave her, um, you know, images of Locutus. And I said, this is kind of like, these are the base forms we want to start with. So create something on Ed's body that sort of has these same shapes. And then while you're doing that, we'll go back and sort of illustrate what goes into those part, or into those spaces. And then it was just a lot of back and forth with the illustrator and her and myself um, and several fittings on Ed um, to make everything work. James? Um, he was pretty simple for us. I think it was more for Vincent creating the the uh, face piece, uh, 3D printed face piece there. Um, obviously at the end when he takes it off, we added a, uh, that it was attached to his skin. So we did a little three-dimensional onset makeup to be able to make it look like it was attached to him. But with the world of 3D printing, uh, Vincent, you can go with that a little bit more, is so, so, so helpful on our end for making all these creatures and monsters now. Yeah, it's it streamlined the process in, in many ways. So it, it allows, Kind of a really great uh relationship between neville who's designing this stuff to then come into the studio with us oftentimes we can actually take some of his design work um and then manipulate that initial design onto scans of our of our talent um and make sure that everything aligns and fits and, and looks right um we can then create positives digitally uh transfer these pieces onto those positives and then print these parts uh to then you know become molds, run foam latex pieces out of it, uh, and have these actual appliances to be sending to James to apply on set. They they work in a, in a really great way to, to achieve something very, very quickly from concept to on set, uh, sometimes in you know a matter of, of a week or so, uh, if it has to happen that way. So it's it's a great tool for us. And and season three of Picard, I think is probably the, the season we utilized um, 3D printing and, and 3D scanning, probably the most out of all of the seasons uh, at my studio. Um, and now that uh, Star Trek Picard has, uh, uh, you know, concluded its three season run, um, what will all of you uh, miss the most about working on this show? Uh, Terry? Oh, wow. Um, Star Trek. <laughs> I miss all of Star Trek. Uh, you know, I'm, it, Star Trek is one of those um, unique uh, properties that um, you have every bite of the apple. You get to, you know, it's it's a uh, it's comedy, it's drama, it's a little bit of horror, it's science fiction. It it it, it sort of encompasses every genre in in, in every way. Um, so. It's a family story. It, it's adventure. Um, it's starships. So you 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 get to do all the things. Um, there's not a lot like that. Not a lot out there like that. So um, it's operatic, you know, in in every way. Um, yeah. So I miss I I really I, I miss being in that world so much. Uh, it's in my DNA. So that's probably what it is for me. Jason, uh, I think for me I I you know I have I have the fortunately I can work on all of the Trek shows, which is nice. And so to be able to sort of you know compare the you know each one sort of has its own personality. I think. In this case, the the legacy of the next gen and Picard and just the stories that went into this, both in the past and when I was coming up watching that show, and even now, it's it was something that was very, I think, unique and meant a lot to me. So I think I, I miss this specifically just because it was something that was very near to my heart. James, I mean, uh, I would say the cast. Um, I've been working with these kids since Deep Space Nine, some of them. So I've been around them for a, for many, many years. So missing as a makeup artist, we're, you know, a foot away from them a lot of times. So we hear a lot of their stories and a lot of their family stuff. We're kind of therapists sometimes in the morning to make sure that they come out of that trailer happy. 
so I think miss, missing my cast, I think, is is the biggest part of it. And again, like we said in the beginning of this, um, this was obviously three seasons, so that's almost four years of of this family that we live with more than we see our regular family. Going to miss those people, and you folks on the screen here too. That's it. Yeah, I think that's it. I think that that when you're on a show like like this, you 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 have a, a small family that you get to know really well. And everyone works together so intimately. You're kind of uh, working with so many different departments and you, you're you having, you know, your morning coffee, having a chat with somebody kind of very regularly. I mean, me and Neville would often start our days uh, having a three hour conversation about, you know, the next episode that I'd get off the phone, call James. We would have a very long conversation about things. It, it, there's a routine that happens there. Um, season three in particular for me, though, uh, out of all of them was was by far my favorite. It, it checked uh, every box for me creatively. Um, I think as a whole, the show uh, was was the best. Um, I, I just enjoyed it so much. I enjoyed the characters that we were able to reimagine. Um, and it, very satisfying for kind of the little kid in me to remember running out and, you know, watching uh, uh, Next Gen with my stepdad, watching it on the big screen and Coming out to his uh, to his living room that he's you know got set up as his theater and 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 being in awe of of these characters and these makeups like uh, you know Ferengis and 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 just being um, just inundated with that world coming back to it now and, and being able to have kind of a uh, a small contribution to to tweak something and kind of add our signature to a character like uh, Sneed as as a Ferengi was unbelievably special for me um so i'll always remember this as, as a very very cool near and dear to my heart project um for the rest of my career yeah terry you you created a kick-ass season for all of us artists to do we were so lucky to have all of you we like we could not have done it without each of you it like yeah it, like truly and michael i mean everything um i mean i it's rare to work on a show where you have so much support from uh, from Terry, from showrunner, from the producers, like, and as much communication and collaboration uh, with all the different departments. Um, uh, but also, all my crew, the whole department was amazing. It was like a little family, um, and the cast was amazing. Like, I mean. Not only had I grown up watching the cast, but meeting meeting them, and they're all just so lovely, and they they know their characters inside and out, and it, it was just a very special special experience. And uh, the Star Trek franchise has uh, often been recognized by the uh, the Emmys for their crafts. Um, you know. For, for those of you who are entering uh, individual episodes for consideration, what em episodes did you go with and, and why? Uh, start with uh, Michael. Um, I asked my assistants and my supervisor which episodes we should submit, kind of what took a vote because I was unsure. There's so much interesting stuff that we did throughout the season, um, you know, from District 6 and the Ferengi and the Vulcans and, so forth and so on and then you know then you get to the final episodes with the borg and the and vox and um you know and obviously the rest of the rest of the cast in their um starfleet uniforms um we ended up uh, submitting episodes nine and ten um because I, we just felt like that was the culmination of the season um you know as much as i wanted to submit episodes with um Vodak and the changelings and so forth and so on it just this was that's what made sense for us uh james and vincent what what's uh, going in for makeup yeah uh, prosthetics did episode 10 and hair and makeup did episode nine so it just it's a culmination of of so many looks from our legacy cast to the borgs to wharf so we got we have a, a good compass a compassing uh, group of uh, makeups from hair, makeup, and prosthetics. 
Um, and uh, Jason, are you uh, submitting the whole season for that category or are you doing the individual episode of visual effects? We're, we're going to do the season just because it felt, you know, with the amount of visual effects in the show, it felt like that was the place that we belonged. Um, and it's hard because, you know, there's never enough time in the reel to show all of the shots that you want to show. So, in, in, you know, inevitably there's things we're going to probably leave out of the reel that we wish could be there. But, um, you know, there's so much that we're proud of this season that it just made the most sense to sort of take the best from all the episodes and put that together to present. And Terry, are you uh, entering for writing uh, and or directing? I think I, I think so. <laughs> uh, I, I think so. I think <laughs> we, we, I think we submitted the finale. I, I, I forget it was a it was a it was a mad dash to do it. I think we submitted. I mean, it's a long shot. Oh, succession. Come on, I'm not. But whatever. <laughs> um, but uh, but yes, I I think I think we did it for uh, in the in the spirit of uh, of of promoting the show for sure. But um, but uh, I think we did. Yeah. Um, and you know, uh, Terry, the show teases future story at the end of uh, the season with the crew of the Enterprise G, um, and of course the return of Q, uh, uh, you know, appearing to Jack. Uh, are there plans to continue the story from here? Is that you know, how open is that door? I mean, the the story is there. The story is open. There's there, there's clearly more story to tell. Um, uh, there's no there's nothing happening at the moment there's nothing in development there's no there, there's nothing there but um um fans have certainly made it known that that's a that, that that's a thing so we're in the middle of a writer's strike we're you know hopefully uh the show seems to have been doing quite well uh so hopefully uh it's up to the television gods paramount has uh, has heard and we'll 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 see one day, hopefully. I don't know. Um, and you know, now that the, the uh, with this season over, uh, you know, what's next for each of you uh, in terms of the work you're doing? You know, it, it, if you can talk about it, of course. Uh, you know, Jason, more uh, more Star Trek, of course. Yeah, all the things. Uh, we're finishing uh, Discovery season five. We've got Strange New Worlds about to drop. I think uh, next week. We got a couple other things that we're sort of in prep on. So. Uh, all Star Trek all the time for me. <laughs> uh, James and Vincent, uh, are you also doing more Star Trek or are you working on other projects? Uh, for me, other projects. Uh, I might have gotten a call yesterday for a little feature up in uh, Canada, so we'll see. Fingers crossed. Yeah, a, a bunch of stuff I, I can't talk about, unfortunately, but we, we did just recently wrap on a show called uh, The Sympathizer. Uh, with Robert Downey Jr., we we uh, uh, designed some fun stuff for that that uh, I'm looking forward to coming out. Michael? Um, I just finished principal photography on a Christmas movie called Red One, um, or tentatively titled Red One, um, and possibly have something else coming up, but nothing solid. Well, I, I want to congratulate all of you on your work uh, on this season of Picard um, and uh, on, on the three seasons in general. Uh, it's been a terrific ride. Uh, and thank you so much, all of you, for talking to me today. It's been a pleasure. Thanks thank you, so Daniel. Much for having us. Having us.